first of all, thank you for, for having me here in, in this exciting um, forum. And um, my name is Volker Schweikart. I am an application manager um, for Leica Microsystems, um, focusing on advanced confocal topics and also in particular on the coherent Raman scattering portfolio here. Um, and um, today it's my, my pleasure to present to you um, a perhaps somewhat different multi modal um, combination of, of um, different contrasts than, than you typically um, associate with the word multimodal. Um, so this will be multimodal optical imaging with biochemical, biophysical, and molecular contrast. And so um, the way um, Leica Microsystems sees the world, we have various uh, different contrast mechanisms available in optical microscopy, starting, of course, from traditional fluorescence intensity microscopy. Um, but of course, there's more information in fluorescence than just the intensity. We can also make use of the, of the excited state lifetime of our fluorophores, um, both to distinguish different um, spectrally similar fluorophores by their lifetime properties, but also to use the fluorescence lifetime as an indicator of the microenvironment that the fluorophore is, is, um, is in. And in, there, in that way, we can, we can generate sensors for all kinds of biophysical and, and biochemical properties in the dye's microenvironment. Um, in addition, we of course have nonlinear optical uh, contrast mechanisms such as two photon or multi-photon fluorescence, but in addition, um, second harmonic and third harmonic generation um, that are available. And um, perhaps uh, least, least well known in, in the community, there's a to totally different type of contrast arising uh, from the chemical vibrations of the molecules that are present in a sample. And the way we see the future at Leica really is that we will be able to freely um, navigate between those different types of contrasts and really exploit the correlations between um, those contrast mechanisms to really maximize the information that we can gain um, out of uh, any given sample. And it is probably um, known to, to, um, to this um, um, somewhat knowledgeable community that quite often if you have multiple different modalities, there can be way more information in the correlations than just the sum of the parts um, that you're imaging. And so at Leica, we have incorporated all of these um, contrast mechanisms into our new Stellaris confocal imaging platform. Um, in particular, as you possibly be aware that um, fluorescence lifetime imaging is very tightly integrated in our platform now, both through the, um, the first um, iteration, uh, which we call Falcon for fast lifetime contrast, and now even more tightly integrated into our platform through our TauSense technologies. Um, and uh, the vibrational contrast is being addressed uh, in this platform through the coherent Raman scattering modalities, in particular CARS and SRS. Uh, and so I will focus a little bit because this is probably the least well known in the community. I will focus a little bit on this vibrational contrast first and what we can do with it, and then go into various um, applications exploiting the correlations to other um, contrast mechanisms. So what can we do with this vibrational contrast and how can we place it into, uh, into context with other modalities? So um, vibrational contrast enables us label-free imaging and we can do that at, at speeds up to video rates. So we can do live imaging without a need for labeling the sample, without having to worry about photo bleaching and also without, with, with fairly limited phototoxicity as you can see in this movie of uh, lipid droplets, um, as well as the overall cellular architecture moving freely in, in these um, small intestinal organoids here. Um, so going beyond simple um, vibrational imaging, we can exploit um, different types of contrast, second harmonic um, generation, and also correlations with uh, visible fluorescence confocal microscopy. Um, and this is in particular powerful when looking at um, complex uh, biological specimens such as tissues. Um, so when you want to really understand a tissue in detail, it's really beneficial to, to pool all the types of contrast that you have available uh, into, your imaging, um, into your imaging session. And this is in particular being used um, for histopathology where people are trying to decide based on very subtle differences in the tissue if this is a healthy or a diseased tissue and then even classify subtypes of diseases uh, based on such combinations of nonlinear optical contrasts. 
um, we can use these um, types of contrast to even image deep inside intact model organisms, again, without labeling. Um, so we can see here as an example of an image of an eye of an intact zebrafish, and you can see the individual layers of the retina at um, cellular and even subcellular resolution, even though we are inside the intact organism. And so what kind of types of research can we support with those contrast mechanism? One is, of course, cancer research. Um, this is an example of a cancer spheroid, so a model system, and I will uh, get back to that sometime later in the presentation, so I won't go into the details. But again, different vibrational contrast mixed with second harmonic contrast can give us a really detailed understanding of the, the cellular composition in such model systems and also how they might respond to treatments. Um, pharmacology is another field that is, is, um, is really um, showing increased interest in this vibrational imaging because it gives us the chance to look at drugs at small molecules uh, where um, we don't have to add a huge um, fluorescent label to visualize the small molecules but we can basically add one single um, chemical bond that will give us a handle to visualize the uh, drug in terms of a vibrational contrast. And lastly, we can even expand this to medical research. And we don't have medical certifications at Leica Microsystems, but we can support basic and preclinical, even translational research with such combinations of biochemical contrasts. Um, and even there's biophysical contrast mechanisms based on the vibrations as well, um, which is shown here um, by detecting um, aggregated amyloid beta peptides um, in a brain tissue. Um, and the specificity for the aggregated amyloid beta versus all the other protein um, content in this tissue really comes from the misfolding leading to a frequency shift of one of the vibrations. So even those types of mechanisms are available. So that's sort of the what and why. Um, the, the instrument um, that we do this on is a regular confocal. Uh, so it would be now the Stellaris uh, confocal microscopy platform. Um, with an additional laser source, um, a, an OPO that um, enables the coherent Raman scattering modalities. So what we have here is a fully integrated visible confocal that also has the capabilities for CARS and SRS imaging. And in parallel, we can acquire second harmonic generation and multi-photon fluorescence signals. Um, I won't go into the details of the beam path. If you have more technical questions to the instrument, you can um, get back to me. Uh, my email will be shown at the end. Um, now, how do we do it? So coherent Raman scattering really is a sequential technique when, when it comes to the uh, spectroscopic imaging. So we basically um, address different chemical vibrations by tuning the frequency between the two laser beams of the OPO. Um, so this way we can take a vibrational image at dedicated vibrational frequencies and vibrational frequencies in the Raman community are typically denoted by this uh, inverse centimeter unit, but you can think of it just as a, as a measure of the frequency of the vibration. And so you can see by tuning the laser to those different vibrations, we can see very different um, contrast rich regions um, in the sample. And the sample here happens to be an untreated slice of apple. So literally you cut a slice of apple, put it on a microscope, no preparation needed, and you can get those types of contrast. Um, and then we can go ahead, pick regions of interest, display the spectra, and then do a detailed biochemical analysis based on this uh, spectroscopic, uh, basically pixel by pixel information. Um, and I just want to show one example of what we can do with this. So this is an eight color spectral unmixing result of this apple sample. And you can see how we can very nicely delineate the different biochemical um, components of the sample. So we can start by the bottom of the sample here consists of the cuticle or the, the skin of the apple. And even that skin is, uh, is divided into several uh, sublayers: the cuticle proper, the ex external cuticle, layer, the internal cuticular layer, and um, then further structures on the uh, in the flesh of the of the apple can be distinguished. And I just want to go a little bit through the spectra that we can see here. So those sharp spectra that we see on the outermost layer are characteristic of a solid waxy phase of long chain saturated fatty acids. 
Whereas if we just go a few microns to the inside, there's a completely different type of spectroscopy visible that points to shorter chains of unsaturated fatty acids, such as oleic acid. And then we have these um, compartments with very, very distinct spectra. These correspond to some of the polyphenolic compounds that really give the apple its, many of its health benefits. And then as we go further into the, into the apple, we see the polysaccharides of the cell walls um, and various pigments um, such as carotenoids. So this is just an example of the types of information that are available in such a seemingly simple sample as an untreated apple. Now I want to go a little bit more into the somewhat more scientifically relevant applications. So in, in, in cancer research, we can get a fairly detailed understanding of such um, spheroid models. So in this case, um, research has prepared um, three types of cells, um, keratinocytes and fibroblasts on the inner core of this spheroid. And then <clears throat> as a last step, they added those uh, melanoma cells that form this more loose layer on the outside of the structure. And we have um, three different contrasts um, that I'm displaying here. One is the total lipid content. One is a more specialized um, unsaturated lipid content. And then in addition, second harmonic um, arising from the collagen that is uh, deposited by the fibroblasts uh, in this structure. And so basically, whenever we put a new type of sample um, or expose it to our vibrational contrast, we learn something new and surprising. In this case, um, it was um, this very rare subpopulation of cells that are showing in bright yellow here. So these are very lipid rich cells. Um, and this is totally unexpected because the researchers were just mixing three types of cells uh, together. So there was no expectation to, to see such a fourth uh, distinct phenotype. And we are, um, to be honest, still investigating scientifically what is the bio biological mechanism giving rise to this subpopulation. And so here is where, um, and of course, we have this information in, in 3D as well. Um, but here's really where then the, fluor the correlation with fluorescence modalities can come in and enable hypothesis testing. So we wanted to know, um, or the first hypothesis was that this unexpected pheno phenotype corresponded to infiltra infiltrating melanoma cells that sort of entered the core of the structure and then through interactions with the other cell types acquired this lipid rich phenotype. So we basically did a fluorescent staining of um, the melanoma cells and the keratinocytes in this system and acquired lipid images um, using the vibrational contrast um, in parallel. And if you now look closely, yes, we see infiltrating um, melanoma cells in the core of these structures but those uh, cells do not correspond to this lipid rich phenotype, rather they appear to be fairly devoid of lipids. Um, so basically the hypothesis was rejected. These um, uh, lipid rich cells do not correspond to infiltrating melanoma cells. But really what's, what, what I want to bring across here is that such vibrational imaging is feasible even in multicolor um, fluorescently stained samples without much crosstalk and, and contamination of the vibrational signals by the fluorescence. Um, I want to move on to um, some of the tissue related um, samples. Um, so this was an example of a mouse skull cap uh, explant that we could take a detailed look at. This is, was one of the examples that I showed already in the very first slide. Um, and so this is a model of osteogenesis. Um, and what we can see here very, very nicely is how we can use um, molecular information. Um, so these are the osteoblasts um, labeled uh, fluorescently with M. cherry and acquired through visible confocal microscopy. Um, and then in combination with um, label-free contrasts from the second harmonics um, from collagen, the bone mineral that is actually just being deposited in those structures. And then we can acquire, of course, various different contrast lipids in this case. So this opens up entirely new um, uh, avenues for investigations of processes such as osteogenesis. And in general, um, tissue biology is a, is a very rich application field for such multimodal imaging. Um, so all of this um, that I've talked about so far has been um, done on either unlabeled samples or on samples where we used some fluorescent labeling to augment the, the vibrational signals. But there's an, a totally new emerging field that is um, dealing with the design and application of vibrational tags. So by simply adding a 
a unique molecular bond such as this alkyne bond here to a small molecule like glucose, you can make this molecule glucose um, acquire a unique vibration that doesn't coincide with any of the typical vibrations that you would find in a biological sample. So the, the typical structure of biological Raman spectra is that we have a high wave number region, um, mostly dominated by CH stretch vibrations. And then there's a large silent region in which there's no biological, um, biologically relevant vibrations. And then we have the fingerprint region where all the other vibrations um, come in. And so in this silent region, this is really the playground that we have to design such unique um, vibrations for vibrational tags where we can then have a background free image of, in this case, the glucose content uh, in our sample. And there's even more to this um, by concatenating several of those um, unique chemical bonds and by altering their chemical environment the frequencies of those vibrations can be shifted somewhat. And because these vibrations are very narrow, these different shifted vibrations are all spectrally distinguishable. And so in this way, a whole palette of distinguishable Raman tags can be created. And one of the applications um, that is currently emerging is the so-called super multiplex optical imaging, where you would combine um, several fluorescence colors with um, multiple of those vibrational tags to generate, um, in this case, uh, 10 color imaging of living cells, but they, this same group has um, already expanded this to 16 and I'm sure they will continue to push this further. So vibrational tags is, is a very new hot field um, that is, is um, making use of, of the coherent Raman capabilities. And so as a last slide, I just want to show you a teaser. Um, I mentioned lifetime imaging and how it is tightly integrated into our Leica confocal platform. And we can, of course, benefit from this in the coherent Raman context as well. So what I'm showing here is a typical image, a typical CARS image that we would acquire from something like a brain tissue sample. So the bright regions to the right correspond to lipid-rich white matter regions. The left half of the image more or less corresponds to a less lipid-rich um, gray matter region that is more pro, uh, pro um, protein dominated. Um, and in such images, we know that we have an autofluorescence contribution as well. And so by using the lifetime information of the fluorophore uh, of the photons, we can now generate what we call an average photon arrival time map, where you can see that the lipid rich and cars dominated um, regions are corresponding to very short lifetimes because the car signals are essentially instantaneous. Whereas those um, protein rich regions um, show a very long late arrival time of the photons that corresponds to autofluorescence. And by doing a detailed uh, two component image fit, we can very cleanly separate the two contributions. So we can have from one acquired image channel, we can now separate out the fluorescence contribution and the CARS contribution very cleanly. So this is just a teaser. This is not yet commercially available, but um, we anticipate that it will be soon. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and i um, happy to take your questions now, but you can also reach out to me uh, by email and there's various resources on our website. Thank you.